My name is Oliver Ressler. I'm the curator of this exhibition Overground Resistance, uh, which is a show focusing on climate activism and shows artists who can be seen as part of the climate just, justice movement. I'm very happy to introduce to you Marco Baravalle, um, who will be the first speaker in our series of uh, events. So Marco Baravalle is a writer, a theorist, a curator, an organizer, an activist, an educator, an on uh, and uh, starting playwright uh, writer, <laughs> you you just no, that's not true. <laughs> you just mentioned a few minutes ago that <laughs> yeah. well and um, um, you are also part of this uh, collective of Sale Docs in Venice, uh, which is also the name of the institution Sale Docs that. Uh, uh, resulted from an occupation of uh, this uh, former salt storage in 2007 and uh, is one of the few institutions that is located uh, uh, where the art scene and activist scene overlaps in a very interesting uh, manner. So what you see there, you can see their exhibitions, you can see their screenings, uh, theater plays, but uh, you uh, also have meetings of activists, assemblies, work meetings. And um, I think um, um, Marco and Sale Docs, they are also closely related with the climate justice movement. So uh, in 2019, there was the first climate camp in Italy. It took place in, in Venice and uh, um, Marco was also uh, closely uh, connected in organizing, co-organizing uh, the event. Um, and yeah, so for this framework of the exhibition, um, your work is kind of a perfect match. Marco is also um, an educator. He's working in the uh, university in Venice. Uh, he's a researcher there and he's uh, teaching in another university in Milan and uh, you are also involved in this collective institute of radical imagination. And your talk today is titled Alter Instituent Practice in the Neoliberal Art World. And yeah, I, I think uh, you deserve a warm welcome. Please say welcome to Marco Paravalle. Thank you very much, Oliver, and also Elizabeth, for having me in the context of this amazing exhibition. I mean, all the kind words that Oliver uh, just said is because I think that also, uh, I mean, Beyond being an admirer of his work, I also feel a strong complicity with him. So I'm honestly very happy to be here with you. And also thank you for showing up in a day that Oliver told me is a very packed day of events. So thank you for your, your time, basically. Um, yeah, Oliver already said uh, basically everything about uh, what I do. Um, I will maybe repeat something, not for the sake of introducing myself, but for the sake of positioning my voice, because I think it's important to, uh, to clarify the position from where I, from where I speak. Uh, I am a researcher at the University of Venice. I'm also part of this collective called Sale Docs in Venice, which manages a, a space that was occupied. We occupied this former salt storage back in 2007 with a group of um, activists and precarious cultural and art workers. And you can see a picture there on the right lower side. You can see a picture of one exhibition of the space. You can see on the other side, on my, uh, basically here on my left, you can see two pictures of what was the 2019 uh, 
uh, climate camp in Venice. So uh, it, what the, what there is an assembly there and there was an action that we did. We basically occupied the red carpet and also Oliver was filming, was filming the, the action. And you can see I'm also with all the people of Solid Ox, I'm also part of the Committee Against Big Cruise Ships. You can see one of the actions we did during the years we took a dog, we were diving into the canal to basically block the passage of the cruise ships in the Giudecca Canal. So, I mean, uh, I speak from this interse intersection of places, from being a researcher, but also from being an, an activist and in a certain way, a curator and a cultural uh, organizer. So my, my Basically, my talk today is informed by these three positions that uh, come together. And you might think that this, uh, basically, this, the, 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 title of my, uh, the title of my talk, which is Alter Institute and Practices in a Neoliberal Art Work, is not really uh, linked with the issue covered by overground resistance that is the climate crisis. But I think it is, it, is, it is enough to go in the other room down there and you can watch one of the films by Oliver, which is titled Barricade Cultures for the Future, um, in which uh, it features uh, five artists that are also uh, climate activists, social activists, and they discuss some urgency concerning the relationship between art and activism or more broadly aesthetics and politics. And some of these issues are the importance of deconstructing the art artificial separation between artists as those with the monopoly of creativity and activists as those with the monopoly of social change. So to basically problematize this border that separates who is creative from who's not. Also another issue that emerges uh, as an urgency uh, in their discussion is the urge to learn that the common is more important than the new. Or finally, one of the final themes that uh, raises a big debate among the participants of this film is the theme of art institutions itself. And you know, questions like do art need, do art, do let's say activist artists need to refuse institutional space? Do they need to create their own institutions or do they need to see uh, even neoliberal global art institutions as possible battlegrounds, as spaces that can be inhabited. And I think the alter, alter institutional perspective addresses all these urgencies, which are, uh, which are I think, crucial uh, when we were thinking of climate justice activism and the role that art can, could play in it, but also in general. Uh, I think it's politically, these are questions that are politically and aesthetically, I think, very, very relevant. And so I was saying the alter institutional perspective addresses all these urgencies. For example, to use, uh, uh, to quote Gera Raunig, uh, for example, by acknowledging the difference between the paternalistic artist and the artistic singularity. What does it mean? And I. For example, what is the difference, as Gerhard Rauning puts it, between the paternalistic artist and the artistic singularity? And I'm quoting a few lines from, uh, by, by Gerhard Rauning to uh, uh, quote a Viennese scholar. And he recalls the distinction between the paternalistic artist on the one hand, who identifies an audience or a community and chooses, and chooses it as her or his object predicting and preceding it. And this is on one side. And on the other side, the artistic singularity, who or which enters into the machinic stream that leads to instituting, where sometimes more, sometimes less artistic skill is needed. Or for example, another, another, uh, another issue that is linked to the reflection around instituent practices or, or alter institution is the idea of problematizing the binary choice between being inside or outside institutions. And last but not least, uh, 
the theme of alter institute practices addresses the, cr the crisis of neoliberal art institution, which has been further highlighted by the pandemic. Maybe later I can do some example of what I do mean practically by the cr crisis of uh, art museums, biennials, neoliberal art institution within the pandemic and why it is important also to uh, reflect on alter institutionality. And, uh, but before going to try to define without trying to be, uh, without trying to create another taxonomy, but let's say to define at least what do I mean by alter institutions, I think it is uh, important to relate to some theoretical sources. And why I think it's important? Because it's not, it's not really, I think it's counterintuitive being the reality in which we are to think that institutions could be uh, something friendly to those that want to transform the world uh, from the side of the common, who want to oppose neoliberal logic and want, for example, to fight for climate justice and against uh, the, cli the capitalist climate disruption that is so well sort of highlighted in this, in this exhibition. And why can we th do we refer to institutions as possible tools in the struggle? We are used to see institutions as those who pollute the world, as those to stop the migrants, let them die uh, in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, we are usually able to see institutions as, for example, as police, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there is a radical thinking tradition that sees institution, or better, not institutions, but instituent drive as an important part of a revolutionary project. And I'm quoting two, two passages. This will be the only two uh, long passages that I will read, so forgive me. Uh, the first is a passage, and I had to read it in Vienna, from the book Commonwealth by Michael Hart and Antonio Negri. And I'm going to read it. Whereas revolt and insurrection may be episodic and short-lived, there is running throughout the revolutionary project, something like a will to institution and constitution. A will to institution and constitution. We have in mind here, as analogy, the great Viennese art historian Alois Riegel's notion of Kunstwöllen, forgive my uh, pronunciation, which, although difficult to translate, can be rendered as will to art. Riegel analyzes how, in another period of transition, late Roman art, revolts against the ancient forms and establishes not only new techniques and industry, but also new ways of seeing and experiencing the world. He conceives the late Roman Kustvollen as the force governing this transformation of the plastic arts, the desire that articulates, so the Kustvollen will be the desire that articulates all the singular artistic expressions as coherent institutional development demonstrating not only the continuity, but also the innovation of the process. So, the Kunstwöllen accomplishes both the overcoming of the historical threshold and the organization of the exceeding overflowing social forces in a coherent and elastic project. And then he makes the comparison with the revolutionary project. So, and they write, a revolutionary process today will have to be governed by a Rechtswöllen, that is, an institutional and constitutional will which, in, in a parallel way, articulates the singularities of the multitude along with its diverse instances of revolt and rebellion in a powerful and lasting common process. To make a long story short, what they are saying is that in revolt there are important, I would say, uh, uh, molecular instances or political, individual, micro-political instances. But in order to step from a revolt to a revolution, something like a, what they call an institutional and constitutional will must be uh, put in place. And this is all the, and from this idea comes all the debate that was started 10, 15 years ago, especially in the networks of southern uh, social centers about what we called back then the institution of the commons, how, how common processes get institutionalized but not crystallized in a way. So, uh, Negri and art thinking and also post-operaist tradition 
could be one of the sources for this, uh, uh, for this focus on the importance of instituent practices. The other one is much older, and it's Gilles Deleuze's uh, oeuvre on David Hume in the 50s. And, uh, and uh, basically, uh, the main contribution that Deleuze makes is to use the theory of institutions in antithesis to the theory of the law. So he sees the institutions, the institution versus the law. The institution is a positive way to organize social desire. It is a positive way to channel the desire for uh, the, the construction of common formal forms of life, unlike the law, which is a limitation of action. So institutions are what empower actions, while laws are what basically limit the freedom to act. So the social and, and institutional bear this positive meaning. Um, for example, let's just read the last three lines. Such a theory will afford us the following political criteria. Tyranny is a regime where there are many laws and few institutions. Democracy is a regime where there are many institutions and few laws. Oppression becomes apparent when laws bear directly on people and not on the private institutions that protect them. You see, uh, democracy is a regime with many institutions. Tyranny is a, a regime with lots of laws and few, and few institutions. Uh, so uh, let's now move to the proper subject of this talk. And, uh, this is something that has to do with, with basically the, the most recent uh, art history, or, or at least the, the art scene in the last 10, 15 years. So what I think can be perceived as, a, as, a, as more than a, than a casual uh, thing that happened is the fact that after the glorious decades of institutional critique, first, second wave, the 70s, the 80s, part of the 90s, at least, uh, at least let's say, since 15 years ago, we see more and more the uh, uh, curators and artists, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, how, how can you say, uh, interest, interested in producing their own institutions, not only in criticizing neoliberal institutions. So it's like a step further from institutional critique. It's not only, uh, let's say, uh, disguising or unmasking the, the, the framework in which art happens, but also the, 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 the will to create new institutions as sometimes as work of art, sometimes as uh, other more complex projects. And I also try to uh, define this, this uh, phenomenon of alter institutionality, but I don't want, I didn't want to give, you know, like a rigid grid, a rigid definition. So instead, I try to list eight challenges that could be, uh, that could be very important to define what alter institution, uh, what alter institutionality is. The first one is the, is capture. Uh, an alter institution should, uh, should challenge the, pow the neoliberal power of capture, which is proper of the neoliberal art institutions. So cultural art institutions still largely work as, ne as what they call neoliberal governmental devising. Uh, that doesn't mean they're linked to any government, but they, they apply a governmental logic on uh, subversive uh, thinking or imagery, etc., etc. So. They capture radical imagery and thinking, uh, turning their subversive and constituent potential into a commercial product. And it is what, for example, to mention another author, what Bojana Kunst uh, calls the powerlessness of art. Um, the idea, for example, that in, in performance until post uh, the, the the proposal of, of the crisis of subjectivity was a major form of radical performing arts, was a major, I would say, uh, challenge, a, a major 
uh, goal of radical performing arts, the idea to show, to bring about the crisis of subjectivity, the decentering of subjectivity. Think from Artaud onwards. And now what Boyana Kunst says is that under neoliberal condition, under post this condition of work, uh, we are asked to be all, all subjectivities in a state of permanent crisis. So this, this crisis of a center subjectivity becomes not what endangers the system, but exactly what feeds the system, because the system needs us to be always in a state of crisis, always flexible, always ready to learn, always ready to modify our, our attitudes, but also our professional, our, uh, professional past, I would say. And so uh, this is why I think it's so important that beyond providing radical content, and this is, I think, something that Oliver does very well, to keep working on the transformation of the institutional structure that conveys our very work. And at the same time, I think, to work in the direction of doing what? Of deterritorializing positions such as the artist, the curator, the performer, the performer towards where? Towards zones of, um, I would say, social organization, stru social struggles, uh, Constituency, etc., etc., um, and it's again we're going back to the discourse of not being the paternalistic artist, but instead of embracing this idea of artistic singularity. A second challenge that alter institutionality needs to face is the, the challenge that I call subjectivation. Alter institutions need to suggest to the artists, to cultural workers, different way to become subjects. What I mean is kind of easy in, 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 in a few words. The fact that for uh, no matter how radical is your work, if your work has only the, the, the uh, art scene as a kind of landing space for your, your radicality, you will be in a way trapped and you will be subjectivized as a, what Michel Foucault called uh, the entrepreneur of the self. So you will be basically trapped into a market logic where the market logic requires Nikes, for example, of, um, of uh, engaged art, for example. So alter institutions are those spaces that open up new possibility for subjectivation. Uh, and, and also that go beyond the binarism of becoming whether an entrepreneur of the self, or, for example, an unproductive artist on welfare state, which, by the, by the way, I don't know uh, if in Austria something like this exists. In, it, in Italy, it doesn't exist. But all the rhetoric around you know, creative industries and all the rhetoric about cultural management, and also the, 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 what, what Gregory Charette calls the, the growing of the bare art world, uh, are narrowing the possibility to see new, uh, I would say, roles, new possibility for our work. And let me tell you an, uh, uh, an opposite example, where concretely we have seen, for example, in Italy in the last 10 years, the possibility to, for artists and art workers and cultural workers to subjectivize in a different way. For example, in the short adventure of the occupied theaters and cultural space in Italy from 2011 to 2013, where thousands of people, of, of artists and cultural workers, started to uh, occupy in more than 10 Italian cities, uh, for example, theaters that were threatened uh, to be privatized. The most famous case is the case of Teatro Valle in Rome, but many other examples. And this was maybe a glimpse, but this was a glimpse in which cultural workers were uh, seeing their role uh, or, or their, their labor force employed in something that we can call the right to the city, to have a meaningful, disruptive, subversive role in relation to the urban polit policies of privatizations of culture. You see? And this was very intense. It lasted. A few, a few years. Saledox was occupied before, was in 2007, but it can be seen even if, if on a smaller scale, because we are a small, uh, a small uh, 
collective, a sort of, uh, I would say, a sort of uh, uh, first experience that then exploded in this issue, in this uh, movement of occupied theaters. So the problem of juridical structure and governance, I'm going very, very fast here. A cultural alter institution must force the boundaries of the law and must be a terrain of innovation on the ground of the traditional juridical person that usually stand behind cultural institutions. Uh, and of course, this political work is aimed to build more democratic governance uh, systems. The idea that we, don't, we are not forced to inherit the juridical statutes that are traditional uh, to, to uh, non-profit art space or even profit art space or a big museum. We can work on those statutes in order to, uh, to make them more democratic. We will go back to discussing the case of the Biennale later. But for example, what was the, the first effect of the protests in 1968 on the, on the Venice Biennial? The first effect was a change in the statute of the, of, the, uh, of the institution La Biennale di Venezia. Why nowadays it looks like our, our institutions are much more open to radical contact and it's fine, I have nothing against it, that's fine, because we also need safe spaces to work, to, uh, to meet, to do what we're doing today. But at the same time, it's much more difficult for radical request to arrive to impact the actual institutional structure of a foundation, of a museum, and so on and so forth. The relation to urban policies, of course, when insisting of the local level, a cultural or alter institutions must not, must not favor gentrification processes. It's, it must avoid becoming a vehicle for boosting rent and real estate market. Uh, this is also very clear if we see, but this is clear everywhere in every city of the world, but it's also very clear in Venice. How art is uh, something that is not in opposition to the model of over-touristification and an over-touristification that gentrifies the city and then puts more and more houses on the tourist market and, and, and basically steals more and more houses to residents. Art is something that is basically packed with, with this uh, gift pack of, of event economy and it's something that boosts this, uh, this destiny, I would call it, of Venice as a place where you attract more and more tourists and you lose more and more residents every, every year. So, of course, the issue of, ur of, urban, of urban policies. Decolonizing. Uh, Again, it's the, the, the being aware of the whiteness of uh, global art institutions, being aware of uh, many things that, uh, fortunately, many uh, uh, campaigns for, for decolonization of uh, the art world uh, tell us to be aware of. It's very, it's very, it's absolutely very important. And again, uh, sometimes we think that this process of decolonization has gone a long way. And again, I will use, sorry, uh, I will use again uh, another Venetian example, but the Biennale is kind, of a, is kind of, a, uh, of a global institution. So I don't know, for example, to, uh, to tell how far we still have to go in the issue of decolonizing our cultural institutions. So for example, if you go to the Biennale, to the film festival, which is basically happening these very days, uh, the prize for the best actor is called Coppa Volpi, the Volpi Trophy. Volpi, the, uh, the Count of Volpi of Misurata, was uh, a governor of Tripolitania, a, por uh, a portion of Libya, when Italy was basically, uh, when, when Libya was a colony of Italy, and he was the first minister of finances of Mussolini during fascism. And so, and, this, and, and that's striking that every year, you know, people from all over the world raise this trophy. No one kind of brings the point that, you know, uh, Volpi di Misurate is still seen in Venice as a great Venetian, okay? So 
I mean, also from the epistemic point of view, not only from the structural or institutional point of view, we have to go a long way. And I think especially, especially in, in Europe, or, or at least especially in, in Italy. Now, fortunately, something is beginning also in Italy too. But the sixth challenge, the problem of binarism between degrowth and acceleration. And this is really relates to the, to the uh, issue of, I would say, ecological, uh, forgive me for the bad word, sustainability of what we do, but it even goes beyond. The idea that, of course, our institutions must embrace a process of degrowth can't be, again and again, the reproduction of the same idea of these huge events with huge crowds fly, flying from all over the world, and staying for three days for the opening and then flying again, uh, flying then again away. But at the same time, I think that what, uh, what our alter institution institutionality mean, means uh, is also to embrace those experiments, which are both activist and artistic experiments, in, um, in uh, recapturing the algorithms, recapturing digital technology, recapturing these technologies that now are mostly employed from the side of capital to uh, instead to implement, to empower the commons. So what I think it's another challenge is this. Uh, I think alter institutionalism means to uh, go beyond the binarism between straight degrowth or acceleration. Seven, uh, queering, which of course has definitely to do with, with sexuality, with gender, with, uh, uh, with, of course, the idea of oppose any kind of sexism, of banalization of genders within the art world and beyond the art world. But I would like to quote uh, Tora Polini because I think it's even more, when I think of queering, I think of something that goes even beyond the issue of uh, gender. And she writes, Although queer theory is most often recognized in relation to sexuality and gender identity, it is at its heart about disruption. It is an approach that most often encourages subjects to recognize the shifting and unstable nature of their positions and identity and to work towards an unveiling and ultimately uh, destruction of regulatory norms. So I, from, an in, from an instituent point of view, I think of queering as the capacity to, to uh, stay metamorphic in a way, to not crystallize into forms that then uh, end up by reproducing the usual hierarchization structures uh, that we, or the, that alter institutional practices fight. So this, this attention, queering as this uh, antipathy towards norm, I would say. And then, last but not least, and of course this is not an exhaustive list, maybe you have other 10 uh, good uh, testing grounds for alter institutionality. Then the uh, last is radical, what I call radical prefigurative economies. From the use of recycled materials to uh, do installation design from this very basic ground to, for example, the use of cryptocurrencies or the experimentation of forms of universal basic income for people that work within this institution. We'll go back to it later and I will provide a, a, a practical example of what I, what I mean by radical prefigurative economy. I also try to, uh, to identify, or I didn't try, I identified two types of alter institutions. The first one, as already said, I call the governmental one, which include mock institutions manifesting themselves as work of art, often signed uh, by an individual author, and they basically live within the art system, or at least they're generating within the art system. But also uh, established institutions, like existing museums, like real museums, or other art, or other art institutions, which undertake a process of becoming minor. In, 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 in a few words, they embrace a process of self-critique of their uh, neoliberal institutional structures. And then, autonomous alter institution, 
which often are the results of social struggles and they involve art and non-art people, they often start with the occupation of a space and develop through processes of assembly-oriented self-management. A small little example could be Solidox, a big example that is also featured in this exhibition. Now the, the, the film is, is off because there is the projector, but it's, it's the ZAD, for example. The ZAD is definitely a, an autonomous uh, alter institution. So a few examples very quickly of what I mean, an example of works of art that, and not only that, I think they uh, clarify this idea. Uh, Jonas Tal New World Summit, uh, which is a parliament in which uh, many um, organizations that are considered out outlaws in their home country are invited to, to talk and to speak, to have a voice. So the idea of a representational space for those organizations that lack representational politics at all. Or uh, the Silent University by Hamet Ogut, which was initiated, uh, uh, I think, uh, again in 2011 or something like that. Probably not the, that exact year, but a long time ago. And I think it's kind of an exception because for what I know, is still existing nowadays because one of the limits of governmental alter institutions is that are, they usually are very, very much depending on the will of the single artist in order to survive or to develop. Uh, basically, the Silent University is a project in which uh, not only migrant people can get classes, but in which they can give classes, in which the usually not recognized knowledge carried by migrant people is recognized and they're not only in the position of the students, of those who learn, but also in the position of those who teach. Uh, Laura Gustafsson and Terike Apoya uh, Museum of Non-Humanity, which inquires the borders between, or, or in, historically inquires as a fake museum, the history of the separation between human and non-human animals in, in, in history, and underlies also how this separation of human and non-human animals was instrumental uh, to, to, to racism and to uh, genocide of the indigenous people, and etc. And uh, so a museum, uh, Tania Bruguera, another very, very famous, fa famous example, the Immigrant Movement International by Tania Bruguera, that was a space, was a social movement, and it also took, at a certain point, the form of a political party that ran for election. So you see here we have several examples of these governmental alter institutions, so a parliament, a university, a museum, uh, a social movement, and a political party. And I mean, I'm not, of course, the first uh, studying these this, um, this works of art. Uh, for example, Sven Lütiken, uh, in 2000, back in 2015, wrote uh, uh, an interesting article about it, and he got together three features that, according to him, were um, to be found uh, as common features of, this, of these different examples. So, and he said, he listed a pedagogical intent, the fact that these alter, governmental alter institutions, they are created to meet the demands of those invisible subjects that are deprived of citizenship rights. And uh, what, or, what we already mentioned, the important role played by the conscious use of communication technologies. Uh, but also the second example of governmental alter institutions is of existing, for example, art spaces, uh, biennial and museums that, in my opinion, have embarked in, in a process of criticizing and also to attempt to transform and to exceed the neoliberal boundaries of what usually an art, a global art institution is supposed to do one, one uh, example, also very famous, which was treated by Claire Bishop in the book Radical Museology, is the example of the Museum of uh, the Internazionale, a network of seven European museums. And uh, specifically, C Claire Bishop uh, uh, mentions the Reina Sofia Museum in, in Madrid uh, um, for different reasons. Why? Because there, uh, it is the case of a museum that, for example, rearranged the permanent collection insisting on a political and social contextualization of exhibited work, refusing the fetishization. And I mean, 
they have a Guernica, so it's very, something very easy to fetishize, but all the effort of the museum staff, of Manolo Borja, the director, and the museum staff, it has been that of recontextualizing, politically speaking, their permanent, their permanent collection. Also, they have another uh, spin-off of the museum, which is very interesting, which, which is called the Museo Situado. The Museo Situado is basically an assembly in which the people from the museum uh, uh, work together with uh, some uh, activist and migrant association of the neighborhood of the, of the museum, Lava Pies, which is a huge neighborhood with a very high percentage of, of for example, of, of migrant population. And they opened the museum not only in order for the people of the barrio to visit the museum, but in order to structure with them a program uh, which is of events based on, a, on assemblies. And in general, it is a museum that, despite being a very, a very huge, heavy public structure, public institution run by the state, uh, has endorsed, for example, many illegal squats in, in, in the city and, and, not, and not only. For example, the, the, the picture that you see in the background with the pink banners, this was something that happened in Malaga. Was, it was promoted by the Museum Reina Sofia and it was called uh, Picasso and la Institución Mostro. Picasso in the Monster Institution and it was held in a independent social space in Malaga and it was a critique of how the, the city of Malaga and the center of Malaga was being gentrified after being branded by the Picasso Museum, which opened, I think, something like 12 or 13 years ago. So uh, um, another interesting, very interesting and I think radical project that they did, not alone, was the, the, called the Archive of the Commons. And it was not the usual, even if maybe interesting, uh, seminar on art and archives, but it was something that they did in collaboration with a, with a Latin, American, um, Latin American network of scholars, of militant scholars, that is called Red Conceptualismos del Sur, the, the, the network of Southern conceptualisms. And uh, they were able, in some cases, to save very important radical uh, Latin American uh, archives, of artist archives, uh, from being uh, bought by institution in the global north. And what is interesting, they did not advocate the archive to come at the museum. They gave the people that were struggling to keep the archive opening, opened in, in, in Latin America, and the resources to digitize the archive, to the, the space to host the archive in, in, the, in the place where it, where it belonged, and in, in exchange, they got the copies of all the items of the archive. So you can still uh, go through the archives at the Reina Sofia in Madrid, but the actual archive is, is there, is in, in Latin America, and is basically uh, saved from privatization and enclosure by the, the global north, let's say. Another example, as I was saying before, is the Biennale itself. Now we are very, pretty much used, I think, and not without any reason, by the way, with many reasons to look at the Biennale of Venice as something maybe still central for the word art debate, but not something radical of exp or experimental. The growth, the, uh, I would say, uh, the, the big success of the Biennale of Venice for the last 20 years ran in parallel to an incredible loss of courage, of intellectual courage from the institution. So they had more and more pavilions, more and more uh, uh, countries who want to participate, more and more visitors, and, and all, this, all this neoliberal growth was glorified as an incredible success for a biennial that instead was seen in the late 90s and in the 80s as an institution in, in a deep crisis. But what is important to remember is also that uh, sparkles or examples of alter institutionalism or alter or instituent practices are to be found in, in, in the history of our, our institutions. For example, uh, I would like to read you, uh, to read four lines that have been written by, um, 
by the steering committee of the Biennale itself in 1974. And exactly the year when the status, the status of, of the Biennale was reformed was changed as a response to the protests of 1968 and a response to the growing climate of social protests in Italy. You know that in Italy we had what is called the long 1968. So basically it was a, in a movement that growth also in radicality from 1968 until 1977. And the Biennale was in a way kind of, I would say, overwhelmed or at least touched by this radical request. And the steering committee, so the president basically wrote this line in 1974. And they are referring to the challenge posed by the protest. So, and they, and they say, at the origin of this challenge, there lies a great change concerning the power relationships among social classes in favor of the working classes. This is the Biennale, okay? Who tend, the working classes, who tend to set themselves up as a datum point for intellectuals in a process leading to proletarization, which also sprang from the use of intellectual work as an immediate productive force. Okay, this is not Tony Negri, so this is the Biennale. So the Biennale acknowledges in 1974 that artists and intellectual workers are getting proletarized because there is a proletarization of intellectual work and labor which stops being an exception and becomes more and more similar to, let's say, factory work. And indeed, we are on the, on the border between two models, between Fordism and between post-Fordism on the, on the 1974, on the, on the border between one model based on the extraction of value mostly from uh, material production to one based on the extraction of value mostly from immaterial production. And this is, this is uh, stunning. This is honestly stunning. And of course, this memory, fortunately now there is a generation of young art historians in Italy that are digging these memories, that are bringing up again this important memory, which was otherwise totally erased by the institution itself and also by, the, let's say, the official uh, histories of the of the Biennale. Uh, the last picture, the one in the lower corner, is a picture of the Shandani Community Museum in uh, Santa Ana del Valle in Oaxaca, in Mexico. And um, why did I put this, this picture? Because, again, as another uh, truly important uh, example of uh, alter institutional practices, we don't have to forget the, the, um, the um, contributions that uh, militant uh, Latin American uh, museum and art people give to museology in the 70s. And there is a, a, a Spanish art historian, Yaiza Hernandez Velasquez, who wrote, for example, about how crucial was the ICOM roundtable in, in Santiago de Chile in 1972 and in which, uh, inspired by Freire pedagogy, many of the participants from Latin American countries put at the side the European people and said, and they use exactly these words, they say, we don't want to keep on uh, uh, reproducing colonial, uh, colonialistic procedures in the museums where we work, we want the new museums of Latin America to become a house of the underprivileged. And again, this is, quote, the underprivileged is exactly the, 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 the word that they, they use. And Hernandez Velasquez uses, I'm not an expert, maybe you know much more than I do, but uh, I, uh, Hernandez Velasquez uses the example, of, the example of the Shandani Museum because uh, it was a museum that it was born of the desire of the local community to retain their archaeological finds discovered in town, okay, and its organization was the result of involving and respecting the long decision-making process of the Zapotec community in Santa Ana, a process carried through pre-existing assemblies and through new ones. So, again, the assembly process that, that stands as a cornerstone for the founding of an art institution, in that case of a museum. And 
and quote, the starting point was not the undisputable value of the heritage to be, of the heritage to be preserved, but the need to retain collective ownership over its possible value, meaning and destination. Not the undisputed value of the heritage, this is where you know, all the conservation discourses in the West start from, but from the importance to uh, keep, to maintain collective ownership over the material things and also the meanings of these uh, finds. So let's spend the last five minutes to talk about autonomous alter institutions. So uh, one of the books uh, produced by the Internazionale was titled The Constituent Museum. And so the importance of constituencies, for example, when we, uh, when we um, think of alter institutions, and especially when we think of autonomous alter institutions, which are those spaces that are not thought as art projects. Maybe they involve some artists, but not primarily as artists, more as activists or, or as members of, or a certain specific struggle. They often uh, are generated by the occupation of a space that which is uh, often abandoned or often uh, uh, threatened to be privatized. They uh, often uh, generate in, in, in spaces that are under the threat of being gentrified, etc., etc. And, and the theme of the constituency is very, is very important. So who, not only who's the space for, but who makes the space? Who makes the institution? And to whom the institution should respond? And we have here in this just uh, in this just, uh, in this uh, picture, uh, I think a plastic uh, uh, image of what I mean by different constituencies. On uh, on your right side, you have a, a banner advertising the sixth annual Brooklyn Real Estate Summit uh, in 2015, and and by chance I was in New York those those days. And I was I, I, I was I witnessed some uh, very also I think participated uh, protests of mostly African American community of New York and many artists again the fact that the Brooklyn Museum which is a public museum and also known for its kind of radical program but in that case they were hosting the Brooklyn Real Estate Summit and you know. We all know how violent gentrification is, especially in New York City, especially in Brooklyn. It's a true like instrument of class war, gentrification in real estate. So who does the museum respond to? Why the museum is there? On the other side, of course, this was a, an easy, uh, I would say, competition. You see the, the you see Sale Docks and you see uh, 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 a general assembly of climate justice movement, uh, a national assembly of Italian climate justice movements back in 2019. And our space, of course we do host exhibition, uh, exhibitions, seminars, workshops. We are an art space and we're happy to be an art space, but our space is normally used on a regular basis by uh, the Committee Against Big Cruise Ships of Venice, uh, Ni Una Menos, the local chapter of the feminist uh, movement in Venice, uh, 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 climate activists, etc., etc. So this is our constituency as an art, art alter institution. And this is not something that is a side aspect to our program of exhibition. It is exactly what now is lacking in Venice. It's exactly what our institutions uh, uh, except very, very rare cases, don't do. What, what is happening now in Venice, and this is also something that is happening in other cities around the world, is the fact that they're opening uh, many new art spaces, but they're always linked to uh, private global financial capitals. They are linked to the idea of art, again, as, you know, as object, as museums, as places where to uh, show private collections that then become get more value on the market and so on and so forth. So this idea of uh, art spaces as, as social 
and as open social spaces is really something that is uh, totally uh, forgotten, for example, in a city like Venice. And even in, not only it's normal that Francois Pinot doesn't, doesn't even think about hosting activist meeting uh, in Punta della Dogana or at Palazzo Grassi. But for example, another thing that uh, we saw as a, as a sort of, uh, that we witnessed as a crisis, as an example of crisis of neoliberal art, art institution during the pandemic, was the fact that the, the Civic Museum of Venice, Civic means that are run by the city and are uh, by statute addressed mainly to the local community, to the residents, they decided in, in uh, February 2020 to remain closed, even if they could have opened, not to basically to uh, preserve the, the health of the workers, but officially, the official statement was because that there were not, no tourists. You see how far this is gone. Even the civic museums closed because there are no tourists in the city. So it is really a matter of constituency. So this, it means that these civic museums answer to tourists and to the tourist industry, don't answer to the residents of a, of a city. Two final example, Macau is an occupied art space in Milano and they implemented uh, what they called a crypto social currency. So a currency which regulates the life of the different collectives that use the spaces. We are a small collective in Venice, we are like 10 people. In Macau there are dozens of people in different groups using the space. And the, the production model of the space is regulated by the social currency which is a digital currency that basically you get rich if you do collaborate among collectives that use the space, you get rich if you share resources, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you have your own wallet of these, what they call the common coins. But at the end of the month, since Macau also has a, an economy based in euros, they have a bar, they get donations, they do partnerships, et cetera. Uh, if, if your common coin wallet is active, you also get uh, uh, a few hundred euros every month as a, as a kind of basic income. And it rewards not only material work, but also, for example, the work of going around and participating to assemblies, participating to social movements around Italy, etc., etc. So again, this is the, the idea of uh, an institutional practice with, which uh, addresses, for example, the financial uh, uh, way an institution works and the financial way an institution rewards the people that contribute to its life. Uh, another, another example that maybe is, ve is very well known, um, it's the example of Moserin. It was a video collective that was uh, founded uh, during the first Egyptian revolution, I think in 2000 and in 2011. And it started as a tent in Tahrir Square uh, where you could, you, know, you could download the video material that you, you, you could have shot during the, the Egyptian revolution. The thing got bigger. They rented, or I don't know if they rented, but they moved from the tent to an apartment downtown Cairo. Then when they left the apartment, they, uh, and this is the picture, this is what you see in the picture, so they, they opened a, a cinema, a proper cinema in Tahrir Square that was showing uh, the, 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 the videos made by Moserin. Of course, after the revolution uh, was uh, defeated, basically they disappeared as, a, as, a, as, a, as an actual, uh, I would say not actual, as a material archive, but they now have online uh, a, digitized, a digital archive of hundreds and thousands of hours of videos shot during that period. And I really think that if we have to, to, basically, to basically refer to an archive of the common, this would be, this would be the case. As, I mean, th there are lots of questions which I think uh, pop up after such a talk, but I would uh, be interested in uh, bringing this a bit also down to earth and see and talk about practical effects. So, um, as you know, I've been working uh, together with Daria Cellini on 
occupied factories as occupation is also something central for this uh, alter institutionality and you working in uh, and co-founded uh, an institution started docs that's also uh, originated in an occupation this um, includes also continuous struggles with authorities about the continuation of the institution and i think I would be very interested to learn from you about uh, what's the legal state at the moment, how did this evolve over the years, and uh, did it change over the years? Could you talk a bit about that? It, it still keep, keeps changing, so we, <laughs> maybe unfortunately we don't run the risk of, of crystallization. Uh, so we, we occupied the space in 2007, and there was an immediate reaction by the city council and they evicted us with the local police. We got back inside, but uh, it's always a matter of, of you know, power relationships. Uh, the first thing, why Sale has been able to survive for 15 years, 14 years now? Because we're not alone. I mean, we're not an isolated entity. We're not a squat that stands on its own, but we are part of a city and, and regional network of other occupied spaces. And this gives us the, the strength also to negotiate with the, with the city council, which is, who is the owner of the space. And this is absolutely important. If we weren't part of a wider network, we wouldn't be able to, to survive. So uh, Basically, the, the first five years of life of Solidox, we were a totally occupied space. We got back inside the space after the first eviction. The city council uh, started to understand that, uh, first of all, that we were serious about it. Um, we also had a serious project and we didn't plan to use it only for parties, which we did, of course, but it not, was not only about <laughs> finding a place to party and, and, and call it a, a, an art space. And, um, and also because back then there was a city council so that was more open uh, to the dialogue with social movements, something that we don't have now. So uh, again, after five years of occupation, we were able to get an agreement that um, for the legal use of the space, we paid a certain amount of money every year, which is a lot for us, but it's really low if you think of the commercial value of a space in Venice which is located such in a central place of Venice, basically in the heart of what is this informal museum uh, quarter of, of, of Venice. So a very, a very, I would say, expensive place, speaking of commercial value of, of square meters there but still a lot for us. Uh, this, this agreement expired in 2019. In 2018 was elected a new mayor who is a total neoliberal figure, like little Berlusconi 20 years later to kind of give you an idea of the guy. And of course the guy doesn't want to renew the, 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 the agreement for the use of the space, so now we are uh, in this gray zone in between something that still has an agreement but uh, it could change from, from you know, day to day. So we are, in, we are in this gray zone but it is two years so far and we are navigating this, this red zone. Also other institutions can in a way are able to, to navigate it even if it's not a comfortable place to be. Hmm. Another thing I'm interested in is uh, your critique uh, of the biennial and the format of the biennial. And uh, I mean, you, you refer to it uh, here uh, as the biennial also as this engine of uh, neoliberal growth in a time actually where we need a lot of degrowth, uh, also I think in the cultural field in, in certain aspects. Um, I, I remember quite well that uh, I think very soon after the biennial, uh, after the uh, pandemic started, maybe already two or three months afterwards, you wrote a text which I consider quite important and that was quoted in numerous other articles in magazines and referred to in discussions. 
where you uh, saw in the pandemic uh, a, a potential uh, for uh, a major shift in the format of the biennial, bringing it more away from the event into something that is more stable and has more effects on the local environment where it takes place. Unsurprisingly, nothing really happened. You know, it looks like the biennial is joining the choir of business as usual. You know, let's, let's just forgive as soon as possible the pandemic and let's restart business as usual. And this is a bit, I mean, uh, this lets you down in a way, even if it's not unexpected. With a, with a slogan, maybe a very reductive slogan, what I wrote in the text was that uh, our institution should uh, take this tragedy of the pandemic, because it's a tragedy, as, but also as an occasion to change from being embedded in, a, in the creative time to contribute to, the, uh, sorry, in a creative city, to be embedded in what I call the caring city. Mm -hmm. So to become more, to think themselves more as spaces of care. And 2020, and also 2021, were a good occasions because the international audiences were lacking. And in, the, in a way, there was a space to uh, try an experimental edition of the Biennale, which again uh, discovers, or not again, which discovers the possibility to become a space of care towards the city, but even towards international audiences, and not only this big attractor that it is, that it is now. So, uh, and this is something that I see, okay, um, uh, you, you, you could think that Reina Sofia pays me. I mean, I'm not hired by Reina Sofia, but this idea of Reina Sofia is not perfect, but I mean, this, this thing of the Museo Situado, for example, it is uh, an attempt of an institution to uh, experiment a dispositive of care towards its, consti its constituencies. Uh, the neighborhood in that case, but could be the city, could be the region, etc. And this was definitely lost. This was definitely a lost chance. And also, you know, I mean, uh, to my knowledge, I mean, maybe document. I don't know, but to my knowledge, or maybe you, you know, but there, there weren't many attempts at you know, uh, creating big forums in which this thing of the pandemic is taken seriously from an institutional point of view, and to really uh, pose serious questions about how this art system works and how it could change. So if a, a global health crisis that uh, cancels 80 or 90 percent of all flights and uh, has many more effects did not uh, lead towards this uh, envisioned uh, more communal approach and shift of the biennial what must happen in order to get there? I think social, major social uprisings. I don't see, I honestly don't see other, I mean, of course, we can all, I, I think we do all uh, important work. I mean, uh, don't misunderstand me. I'm not judging as, uh, I don't want to diminish uh, art. Uh, it's not my, my thing. But I think that honestly, to in order to recover this possibility of really affecting institutional structures. Uh, we need major social uprisings and, and yeah, but it's, uh, it's very difficult because now our institutions are very good at absorbing uh, critique. Yeah, I think in order to achieve major political uprises, we need different sectors, different social fairs to merge and to come together and I think uh, your position of uh, uh, working in so many different fields as a curator, as a theorist, as an organizer, as an educator, uh, as someone uh, who is not only an activist in the sense that you participate in demonstrations, that, but that you really co-organize movements, climate camps, uh, and, and other things. Um, I think such knots are really crucial in, in such a time when, when we need to bring people together. And I would be interested in learning more of 
how this all interconnects and how uh, this um, how this all comes together and supports each other and uh, maybe you could talk about this a bit. I mean the, the, the only choice I really took in this fact that I'm doing so many different things is being an activist. This was the only actual planned choice. Uh, you know, it goes back to Genova 2001 when I was there and I got sort of pissed with, with the Italian state, with capitalism in general. I, I decided, yeah, I want to join activist networks, I want to join the Centri Sociali in my case, etc. And all the other things, to be extremely honest with you, came because I I mean, I also needed to work. I mean, I don't want to romanticize it. I mean, uh, I, I, had, I had the chance to be involved in this collective process of Saledox, which I think in a very rare way uh, overlaps my activist part and my curatorial or cultural organizational part. And this was basically the dispositive through which I was able to, to keep to match these two aspects of what, I'm, of what I'm doing, to keep them together coherently. And without, without this, all these collective adventures, uh, I would definitely not be able to do what I'm, what I'm doing. And then for, for also, I mean, I, I think I paid the price. I mean, from, from 2007, basically until 2000 and, 17, 18, I was kind of invisible for the art world, you know? Uh, I was also, I mean, my, my stipend was coming from, from other jobs out of the, out of the film of, of field of art, which had nothing to do with art. My only artistic uh, space was the, the, really the independent space of Saledox and of, of these uh, alternative circuits. And yeah, and then, you know, and then, uh, I don't know. I don't know why it happened that I'm doing so many things. Probably I'm not doing any of them very well. So, but navigating them, let's say. I think this is maybe also the invisibility uh, in the film barricade cultures uh, for the future. Here in the exhibition, Jay Jordan refers to that if you are really uh, uh, strict in your resistance, then. Uh, it will also happen that uh, many institutions won't invite you anymore if you go after the funders and, uh, and uh, if you're very precise in, in your critique. But I'm happy to see that, uh, that you managed to, to uh, keep some visibility. Also, thanks to people like you. <laughs> but invisibility is not bad per se. I mean, also, as Jordan says, it's not bad. Yeah. Are there any questions from the remains of the audience? Um, thinking about institutions, um, I think that you can, it's a comment from the South. <laughs> um, I started thinking about your uh, alter institutions, and that is a condition that you can start deconstructing when you actually have institutions. And I'm thinking uh, on the museums in South America, uh, of course not the anthropological museums or the historical museums, but the contemporary museums. Um, I, I was the director of a museum in, in Quito. We didn't call it museum, it was the Centro de Arte Contemporáneo. And we did not have any institution at all. So we had to be building from precariousness and from the lack of local history on contemporary art institutions. And so we invented, we invented it. It became altered in the making. Yeah, sure. Because um, we didn't have spaces of mediation with the community, so that's one thing that it became so, you know, right away. We didn't have a space where uh, movements could meet and uh, organize, like Marcha de las Putas, or uh, Nuna, no, Nuna, Nuna Menos, sí. or the people, the, 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 hmm? or the Yasunidos movement against extractivism in the Amazon, uh, and it just became like that. Um, so it's interesting to, uh, you know, to compare these things, and it, it became like a, a mediation space with the community, and 
space that could make a little bit more secure the yep. neighborhood yep. Yep. because you had more people going there and less people assaulting you in the yep. streets in that neighborhood. So it makes me feel like, uh, yes, on one side we have the northern part of the planet that has institutions and has have to be deconstructed, and on the other hand, we have places that they they emerge or they are born already deinstitutionalized because the emergency of our needs uh, just make them like that. You know, these we, we made this kind of a building that was permeable and things were happening in and out and um, so it's I was just you know thinking about we no. don't have the chance to deconstruct institutions because we don't have them. first and, yeah. So First of all, I would like really to know more about uh, your story at this museum because it really, really interesting, interests me a lot. And yeah, I mean, I totally agree with you, but I think despite you being working in an official museum, your alter institutions, I, I don't want to label it, it's stupid, but uh, seems much more like an autonomous alter institution, something that you build from scratch, even if it's uh, recognized as, as an official museum. It's a city museum, but, but you, had to, you, you really had to, to build it from scratch. So it's kind of closer to an autonomous alter institutions than to a governmental one. And yeah, I mean, it's absolutely interesting. So yeah. What was the name of the museum again? Or what is Centro de Quito? Yeah. It was, a, it was a, an old uh, hospital. Uh, and then it was a military hospital, and then it was a mental health hospital, and then it was occupied. It was, I think, also the headquarters in a stupid war that they yeah. had in the, in the 30s. And then, uh, yeah. And is it still running? It's a still running, yes. It's a still running. And it also has uh, spaces for the, the children of Colombian and Venezuelan refugees yep. that go there. And it's, uh, yeah. It had to become right away, something else, yeah. because nothing else or, uh, was there before. Th would you define it as a community museum? I think so, yes, yeah. absolutely. But still run by the city, so it's, it's like this hybrid yeah. that we don't think much about institutions because that's... <laughs> that's what you don't have. <laughs> yeah, I understand. In the presentation, I was uh, thinking also about the like, quite complex situation that I'm kind of like seeing in Latin America, for example, the use of protest aesthetics by artists uh, that supposedly are left wing. Uh, but then, like, we see in the, in the proper context how they are dealing with the grassroots movements, with the left wing organizations with the regional processes and different revolutionary processes. And then it comes, and I'm referring in specific uh, to Tania Muguera, for example, no? I mean, like, it's totally legitimate to uh, criticize or uh, sign any type of government or whatever. But I think it's completely different if we talk about the European government, US government, or Colombian government, for example, than if we talk about Bolivia, Venezuela, or Cuba, because the conditions that are given in those contexts are not only dependent on a sovereignty that they are deciding on that, no? they are under conditions of blockade or of, uh, for example, uh, sanctions, that many times in that type of approaches, or for example, artists that do not recognize that Bolivia went through a coup d'etat, you can be critical with Evo Morales, but like denying that there is an extreme right wing that is operating like worldwide in order to uh, like impose sanctions, uh, uh, put uh, blockades, make up the data, etc. It's really complex. And when uh, uh, there was this uh, moment in Cuba, uh, the request of going, for example, to protest to the embassy of, Peru, uh, of Cuba in Peru was really complex for us because there, there, were, there were the extreme right-wing Fujimori people yep. that we were confronting because we were in the middle of a welfare process for making a coup d'etat in the context of Peru. So 
it's not not claiming, but it's really complex when you use like revolt aesthetics that uh, have come and they have a genealogy, and that, and then at the end of the day, I started seeing like people sharing, for example, things about Cuba with a yellow flag, you know, the fascist yellow flag, and like it was going through, no, and and uh, or seeing, I don't know, like uh, the silence about. Okay, obviously, we need constant discussion of what what are the processes in the left, but we cannot have a political discussion without recognizing there is a blockade and there is a. There is imperialism, there is colonialism, there are many things there, no? So um, I was uh, wondering how how you see this type of, uh, I don't know, like uh, vision strategies that many times many times can be like uh, useful for the other side, no? And that's, I, I consider, uh, like a risk, no? Yeah, but I mean, I totally understand what you say. I'm not going to give you my opinion about Latin America because it's something that I don't know enough to, to maybe, maybe with a beer, but not, uh, not here. I mean, it's, uh, I, I don't feel entitled to say any truth about Latin, Latin America, no, but, uh, but I mean, but I, mean I, 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 see, I see the problem. The, the, I think in general, the problem that you are lighting is the problem of aesthetization of, of, of politics. And this is always something, it was already Walter Benjamin who wrote against the aesthetization of politics as something that in the end will, will uh, advantage uh, reactionary regimes in a way. So I think the point is never to aestheticize politics, but to uh, really have a, have a, certain, a certain complex approach to the politics of aesthetic. Uh, and this is, I think, a general problem when we, when we refer to this sort of use of, of, of uh, visuality that you, that you indicate. And also, I think, if we speak of Venezuela, for example, uh, you are much more expert than I am because you worked a lot. And I think the, the uh, films that he shot, I don't know if you have seen them, uh, with, with Azzanini many years ago, I think 2009, I don't remember. Was the last one. Was the last one. Yeah, 2009 was, was the last one. These are very interesting because in a way they, uh, I think they break the, the binarism between uh, glorification of Chavez and or, you know, a, a, a total opposition to Chavez model of state. They were, you, you, you threw the works of, of, Res, of Oliver, you could, you know, look, for example, at grassroots of organization. You could have, you know, a sort of uh, eye on the ground and you could see, you know, all the positive features of that political model. And, you know, you could also, you could also see how, especially in the last film, some of the people that were involved in, in, uh, in the revolution, basically, in the Bolivarian uh, revolution, were becoming s skeptical. Not because they were fascists, but because the revolution was basically uh, sort of um, becoming, you know, or, or not meeting the, 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 the premises. But I don't know what you think about it. You, you, you shot the, the films, so I think, I think this is a good way to approach a problematic zone and but I see what I see what you mean and, and I'm because like then you see for example I Weiwei you know, yeah. he's like this type of artist and, and then like all cool with Li Weiwei and all that but it's there is a political strategy within I Weiwei critic to China it's not sure. a, a it's not a revolutionary critic to China no definitely not it's a it's a really useful uh, critic to China uh, for the states or then when all this was happening in Cuba and there were all these like uh, uprising aesthetics being used. Uh, suddenly, there was an artist, uh, a Cuban artist, that threw paint. It was a group of Cuba, to uh, Jose Martí yeah. monument, and that was grabbing like all the struggle of uh, migrant and Russianist people in the global north against uh, colonial monuments. That is not Jose Martí. Whatever the revolution in Cuba or the government in Cuba or uh, Diaz Canel or whatever, pero. It's not Jose Martí. Yeah, but it's not Jose Martí. Yeah. What he means, no? The meaning of Jose Martí is not the meaning of Leopold II. It's not the sure. meaning of Columbus. Sure. It's not the same meaning, no? So it, and it was 
skinny because aesthetics were being used for erasing a complex process, a complex political, but, but precisely the complexity, no? Uh, and uh, making it look like as a, let's say, a, another uprising in the world, you know? And where the context is completely different from, uh, let's say, Spain or the States. Sure, sure, no, no, I agree. Thanks, Daniela. Um, Marco, I think we should wrap it up, but as a final question, uh, I mean, you're also co-organizer of this coming climate camp in Milano uh, that will be from September 30 to October 3, second. Uh, and maybe you could give a bit of an outlook and also how this might be maybe different in comparison to previous ones before the pandemic? Yeah, it, it's different because first of all it's in Milano. It's the first time that we organize it in Milano because there, there is going to be, uh, it's going to run parallel to the pre-COP, so the pre, one of the preliminary meetings to the COP26 in Glasgow that will happen on the 26th. And the idea is basically to uh, create a bridge from Italy to Glasgow. So our idea is to uh, basically to invite people from all over Italy, also from all over Europe to join us in, uh, in Milano and then to also to be present in Glasgow on the 26th of November because I think that it's undeniable that the pandemic kind of uh, slowed down the climate justice movement, but it's also undeniable that the pandemic is it's a symptom of climate crisis, it's a symptom of a certain uh, neoliberal uh, relationship to, uh, to the web of life. So I think that it's up really to us to get this movement restarted after this forced pause of the pandemic.